This is Talkish. I am Hallie Kasser Jane. The Hallie Kasser Jane Show is always available online at HallieKasserJane.com. Now, let's get to it. On episode 308, a few questions. Authoritarianism, can it happen here? How about this? Is Brown the new white? Questions, we bring you the answers. On Talkish, the Hallie Kasser Jane Show, when joining me are... Harvard professor and founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy, Cass Sunstein, author of Authoritarianism in America, Can It Happen Here? And national political leader, civil rights lawyer, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and the founder of Democracy in Color, Steve Phillips, the author of Brown is the New White, how the demographic revolution has created a new American majority. It's time for Talkish. We begin with Cass Sunstein. And this, Can It Happen Here? Authoritarianism in America, Sunstein's new, much-talked-about book, a compendium of essays by our country's leading legal and political minds that features the thoughts of many, including Samantha Power, Bruce Ackerman, Duncan Watts, and others. How do democracies crumble? How does propaganda work? What is the role of our various national institutions in the modern political landscape? Under Trump, is America on the brink of falling under authoritarian rule? Cass Sunstein is the Robert Walmsley University professor at Harvard, where he is founder and director of the Program on Behavioral Economics and Public Policy. A columnist for Bloomberg View, a frequent witness before Congress, and an informal advisor to many public officials in national, state, and local governments. He has served as administrator of the White House Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, as a member of the President's Review Group on Intelligence and Communications Technologies, and as an attorney advisor in the U.S. Department of Justice. His many books include New York Times bestsellers. It's time for Talkish. Let's talk with Cass Sunstein. We surely do live in interesting times, Cass, don't you think? I mean, the times are crazy. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Whoever thought we'd be saying yeah. the United States and authoritarian in the same sentence? But we are. True. Let's begin here. Talk to me about what is authoritarianism. You know, it's a term that's thrown around by a lot of people. I'd, I'd like you to define what, what, what it means. And, and what are the earmarks of an author- authoritarian government? Have at it. Uh, I'd use the term in a more colloquial sense, that is to mean a government with unlimited power. So if you think of Nazi Germany or maybe contemporary uh, Turkey, uh, very possibly contemporary Russia, um, the leaders in authoritarian countries, they don't have to face an independent judiciary. They don't have to get permission from uh, a legislature, which is separate from them. They don't have to respect rights. And that uh, kind of authority to do whatever you want uh, can lead to rapid solutions to real problems, but it means that uh, freedom and self-government are gone. Fascism, populism, nativism, authoritarianism, there are a lot of isms being tossed around in the age of Trump. They aren't necessarily different. Talk to me about the relationship between populism and authoritarianism. Populism means uh, we the people are uh, pressing for things and basically able to get the things for which we're pressing. And so populism has a pretty good legacy in the United States. Uh, It came originally through the American Revolution, which is what gave birth, of course, to our country. That was a populist revolution. And it did not lead to authoritarianism. On the contrary, it led to a system that um, powerfully combats authoritarianism. Uh, But it is possible, history shows, that a populist movement uh, can have such passion and energy in it that things can turn very sour. And one way that could happen is if uh, people think, you know, we need to give authority to a strong man, typically it is a man, who can get stuff done and act in our name. And that is the story, really, of uh, authoritarianism in some nations in which, ironically, uh, an exercise public gave birth to something really awful. Let me ask you this. 
Why did you write this? Uh, you've got a bunch of people together to write different different aspects of this, and I'm assuming this was written when. I'm assuming when did you put it together, the project, and what? Why? Why did you think it was necessary now? Well, the reason was when President Trump was elected, and I think it was around there that the book came to my mind, uh, a lot of people on both the right and the left were talking about authoritarianism, and I thought there was a lot of loose talk, and whether you know you love President Trump or not, whether you think President Obama was an authoritarian or not, uh, it's, uh, it's a kind of um, uh, enduring question that we haven't had an investigation of, really, I think, except through fiction. So there's an old book uh, uh, written by Sinclair Lewis, which is uh, about this and depicts the rise of fascism in America. There's a newer book by Philip Roth called The Plot Against America, which is about the rise of something like Nazism in the United States. But to get people who really study these issues, whether they study government, whether they study law, whether they study... uh, uh, history to get them thinking about this, I thought would you know provide, provide a place people could look. Whether the answer on reflection is no, it can't ha- happen here, or uh, maybe under awful conditions it could, to provide a resource uh, that we could organize our conversations around on this question. Do you sense uh, a real threat to American democracy with this president and his group? Uh, I don't, is the the shortest answer I could give, though many people in the book uh, are more pessimistic than I am. So my own view is that our, our institutions are extremely robust and that our system of checks and balances is, is a really strong safeguard. Uh, I would have a cautionary note against my own optimism. <laughs> One is that the current president has attacked institutions, independent institutions, in a way that we really haven't seen before, where our president has gone after the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation and treated it as if it's a political instrument of the Democratic Party. And that's really completely, uh, 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 what's the right word, uh, untoward and an insult to people who are working without fantastic pay to protect the American people. And so that's worrisome. The attack on the media, calling them fake news, that's very similar to the Nazi phrase, which was lying press, and describing uh, the press as the enemy of the people. That's that's really uh, uh, concerning. And going after the uh, entities, uh, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, I mentioned, but also the Department of Justice, which has a, a tradition, at least, of independence, its investigative and prosecutorial decisions. So I see those as not threatening you know, we're going to go to fascism in the United States, but uh, undoing norms that have been part of our um, uh, our, our liberty and our capacity for self-government. And, and that is, uh, uh, at a minimum, concerning. Okay, concerning. You just listed a whole lot of stuff, and I mean, and we, and, and that is doesn't even touch on some of the things that have gently or 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 gotten gotten through. So I'm going to bring this up. I was going to bring it up later, but I'm going to bring it up now. And that is, what concerns me is the fact that his party and this Congress are not standing up to him, and every little chip in a wall eventually li- leads to a wall breaking down. Do you have concern over the fact that the Republican Party is lockstep with all the garbage that he puts out, all of the times that he breaks the rules? Because Congress may be as much of a problem in all of this as, as you know, the little things that he does. Some may be out of just sheer stupidity, some just because he's a bully. Some, uh, Congress worries me. Does it worry you? Yes, definitely. So, you know, I work for President Obama and I usually vote. Democratic, not always, but usually. And before I get your question directly, I'd say if I think this would be most unfortunate, but put that to one side. If uh, Bernie Sanders were elected president, there are things he would. I'm confident that would not be good. 
and that even if you like him, you should feel free as a Democrat to say this is a very bad thing. And I hope Democrats would say that. That's a preface to agreeing with your point that uh, Republican silence with respect to some of the words and deeds of President Trump is extremely disturbing and I think uh, even surprising. I worked in the Obama administration has noted, and I got to work with a number of Republicans on the Hill, and I admired them as people and as public officials, and I'm, I'm stunned, as you are, by their uh, relative silence in the face of some things that, that aren't good. Now, I think I understand their calculus. Partly they're thinking, you know, he's, he's our president, and he basically agrees with us on stuff. So we're going to be quiet about the stuff that's not good, and we're going to work with him on the stuff that is good. And they're also thinking, I think, to pick a fight with him is to create some sort of political risk for us. He's, he's, he might fight us back, and that'll hurt our chances for re-election, or some of our voters might turn against us. So I understand that, but um, I agree with you completely. It's not good. And if things get really worse than they've been, uh, you know, it might involve the Russia investigation. It might involve the uh, Mueller investigation. It might involve policies or uh, demonization, let's say, by the president. The Republicans um, should be, let's say, incentivized by their own voters to take a stand. I'm worried about those voters, too, though, because I don't see them uh, uh, moving uh, even so much as an inch. He can do whatever he chooses to do. And he seems to still have their backing. I want to go on to the word centrist. (laughs) Is is that in our lexicon or did they take that out of the American Dictionary? I'm not. (laughs) I'm hoping it exists. I'm I'm just hoping, hoping, hoping. But in an age in which the radicals of our political discourse on both sides seem to have the strongest voices, let's play with that word um, center and central. Is a powerful central government a good thing, a threat to our liberty, a safeguard? Talk to me. I know you you, you talk about that in the book. Yeah, the, the book actually has a lot of different views on this, and it's a fantastic question, I think. I didn't anticipate this when I put together <laughs> the book that this would be a focus. But, yeah. uh, okay, so one, one view, which I think is completely fair and kind of natural, is uh, central, a strong central government may be a good thing or may be a bad thing, but it's a, it's a problem for liberty, so that there's a serious risk that uh, if the government is strong, that it'll do terrible things. And uh, that is, I think, true. Uh, but there's another view which ha- has truth in it, which is if you have a strong central government, the power of an authoritarian to take it over and use it for his or her purposes is sharply limited. So one of the authors in the book says, uh, come on, we can't have authoritarianism in America. The government's too big. And that's a very interesting idea. And the grounding of it is, you know, you've got people who work at the Food and Drug Administration, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of State. If the president tries to get them all to do something awful, they're going to say, yeah, right. And that, in his view, is a safeguard against tyranny. And he compares Nazi Germany, where the uh, central government was actually small, relatively weak, and that was a um, a fair point that that he's making. That the U.S. in some ways is uh, protected against tyranny by virtue of the fact that there are all these kind of good civil servants who presidents of different political parties often find annoying, but they are there to protect uh, us, even if they're protecting us against their bosses. So I want to go back to, to something Trump said uh, was it last week, I think, he, uh, the canary in the coal mine. I called. He said, do you believe, oh, I know it, it was when president of China uh, move to to extend his power indefinitely, and and Trump comes out. He's now president for life. Trump told the Republican donors, and he's great. You know how he talks. And look, he was able to do that. I think it's great. Maybe we'll give that a shot some day. You've been around Washington for a very very long time, Cass. We don't really know these guys. I mean, you know, they're putting forward to us, and and uh, uh, they have different personas behind uh, you know the walls. I'm sure. Do we miss his sense of humor? Is is that part of the problem? Are, is, was that meant as a joke, maybe? Uh, or some of the things that I he says, so. and we don't get it. We just, he's got a terrible sense of humor, almost as bad I, as Nixon's. I, I think a lot of his sense of humor is braggadocio. 
So I think a lot of his jokes that turn people off or maybe make his supporters smile is they're saying, you know, I'm the greatest there's ever been. And that I think he tweeted, the Oscars got so such bad rating, there's no stars anymore except your president. And that that's where his humor goes. And I think, you know, that's fine. Uh, so that comment, the quote, bothered me less than it bothered many people. One part really did bother me, though. It's the part where he said he's great about uh, a leader of China who may be a nice guy. Actually, I've met him, and he seemed like a nice guy. But... Uh, the leader of China is not great. I mean, he's important, he's impressive, he's someone with whom we should work. Uh, he's not a friend of the principles for which our country stands. And for that reason, he's not great. So to say behind closed doors, he's great rather than he's impressive or we're working together well, that's, you know, don't go crazy about that, but it's, that's, that's not good. He does seem to have an affection for, for dictators, though, we must admit, right? I, th- I think you're not wrong on that. You think yeah. I'm wrong? <laughs> no, you're not wrong on oh, that. Oh, not wrong. And, I'm glad. I no, got no, worried. No, I'm, I'm, I'm phrasing it gently. No, I think you're not wrong on that. And you know, and there hasn't been, kind of, let's uh, phrase it lightly, there hasn't been strong assertion of American values uh, on the part of the president, and you know, I, I like to think, and I feel confident that his heart, of course, he believes in them and self-government. But these are not part of his, you know, uh, uh, weekly or even monthly uh, presentations. Very odd man. That's all I have to say. He went to military school. It's hard to believe, right? Some of the things that come out of his mouth. Uh, I, I, well, I feel I should say you know I, I feel just my own perspective. Everyone ahead. can take their own view, but sure. I feel he he is the president, and I feel he's he's not due reverence, but he's uh, uh, he is due respect uh, for the office if, if for anything else. And I I prefer to focus on you know concrete things like the attack on the press and the attack on the FBI that are. Uh, less than good, let's say, the failure to obey the law with respect to protecting children against lead paint. That's a concrete thing. And uh, and to think of it with uh, uh, you know, more in sadness than anger, I think, and then to think, what are we going to do about them? I, I think that's a, a good point of view. I will say this, though, and I've had this conversation with, with many people uh, on the show and off the show, uh, concerning the fact that this is the first time in their lifetime that they can remember not respecting the president. But the, the the president doesn't seem to respect a lot of what is so American, our moral turpitude, things like that, and that it's very hard to go and then rein that respect. So I guess we get into the old conversation, Cass, about respect the office, not necessarily the uh, office holder. Uh, and, and, and I think that that's kind of sad, and I think it, it it's a part of this conversation you and I are having today. Can we talk about this? If he wanted to be a dictator, what steps would he take? What should we watch for? Well, I think if any leader of the United States sought dictatorial power, the thing to watch for is concrete attacks, oral and worse in deeds, on independent sources of authority. So you'd want to see attacks on the judiciary, or co-optation or uh, uh, disempowerment of the judiciary. You'd want to see um, uh, efforts to either silence or delegitimate the independent press. Uh, You'd want to see efforts to find some way to uh, disable uh, dissenting views, either through the extreme case uh, jail or the less extreme case um, marginalization. Uh, You want to see attacks on the uh, legislature in a way that would manifest itself both in efforts to treat it as irrelevant through words and ultimately through actions that basically bypassed it. That would be kind of the repertoire of stuff. Hmm. Interesting. Can we talk about Russia for a minute? Uh, Sure. How do you see all of that? Um, Very grave. So much worse than tweets. So the fact that uh, we have um, uh, uh, interference with our 
the democracy by a country which is not friendly to us is very, very alarming. Uh, and it doesn't even matter for these purposes whether the uh, the interference swung the election. Just the fact that it occurred and was in important ways successful, that's really disturbing and grave. That is a, a direct assault on our capacity to govern ourselves. The fact that the White House appears relatively indifference, indifferent to the interference, either denying its occurrence or taking uh, those who call attention to its occurrence as trying to delegitimate him personally rather than trying to protect our uh, our capacity for governance, self-governance, that's, that's really troubling. So of all the things we've discussed, this may belong at the top, uh, and it's puzzling to think why it's happening. And I think the most innocuous explanation is just he doesn't want his own presidency to be delegitimated. But put that to one side, he ought to. Russia does not belong in our electoral processes. And there's a lot of stuff we can do to reduce the likelihood that it'll happen again or reduce the likelihood that it will be powerful. And uh, we should do those things. And we, at the same time, you know, uh, we're working productively, I hope, with Russia on many things. Uh, but this is not something which is part of a uh, productive relationship. I think it's interesting. Um, you said uh, you know, that it won't happen again. It, it's, it's my contention that it's continuing to happen. I mean, they are infiltrating us as we Apparently. speak. And yeah. I find it just yeah. outrageous that uh, you know, um, it's been allowed to, to continue, which says a lot also about you know, a president of the United States who would put his own reputation, if you will, on the line before that of the country. I think there's already an asterisk uh, against uh, um, his presidency, so maybe, that's what, maybe that stings. And and uh, with a man with his ego, maybe that's uh, we can understand why why uh, it stings. I know you are. I agree with you. Right, go ahead. I agree with you on everything you said, including the idea that it hasn't been stopped, um, and that's uh, really disturbing. And you know whether you voted for President Trump or not. Uh, Russian interference could go any way. It could go pro-Democrat. It could go Republican. There was an effort to uh, make sure President Reagan wasn't elected by the Russians when they had much less skill. And so put to one side your politics. This is a, a threat to our most fundamental institution. Absolutely. And speaking of our uh, most fundamental institution, the Constitution, how do you think it's holding up in the 21st century as so many new things have come into our world, uh, including uh, big bad guns uh, and other things. Ooh, uh, what do you say to that? Uh, is is it a, is it a document that um, is making it through? <laughs> uh, holding I so. up. I think our I, I think our constitution is is doing great. Um, so the, the I don't think these are the best moments in our history for our government, and you know there are multiple reasons that things aren't going as well as they might. But I think our constitution is is helping. That is, it's prevented um, some steps that you know Democrats and Republicans have both explored that it would be best to have prevented, and it's uh, checking the government's authority to lurch. And that's uh, something that uh, we should be grateful for. I've tossed a lot out at you. I'm going to have you toss one back at me. If anything has you riled up at this point and worried, what is that? What would you say to me? Hallie, this concerns me. It's uh, polarization in America and division, which uh, uh, the president has fueled. So the fact that uh, Republicans see Democrats as often as demons, and Democrats see Republicans often as demons. That goes beyond the moment-to-moment, -moment, uh, you know, badness or worse or almost badness. Uh, it, it suggests a, a risk to our capacity to solve problems. So the fact that we can't get infrastructure improvements in the United States, and that's you know, would be a great benefit. We can't do it because we're so divided is amazing. And it's a, a signal of uh, an obstacle 
that our um, what is it our culture has run into. That that worries me a lot. So the name of the book is Can It Happen Here? Yes or no, Cass? Can it happen here? My own view? No. I've been speaking with Cass Sunstein, author and contributor to an important new book of essays, Can It Happen Here? Authoritarianism in America. Available at fine bookstores everywhere. You are listening to Talkish, the Hallie Casser Jane Show. My guests today are Cass Sunstein and Steve Phillips. Talkish with Hallie Casser Jane post new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern at Hallicaster Jane dot com and via all of your favorite apps and on your Alexa device. <laughs> Now, Steve Phillips. Steve Phillips is a national political leader, civil rights lawyer, author, senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, and the founder of Democracy in Color, a political organization focused on race, politics, and the multiracial progressive new American majority. He is a co-founder of PowerPack.org, a social justice organization that conducted the largest independent voter mobilization efforts backing Barack Obama, Cory Booker, and Kamala Harris. In 2014, he co-authored the first-ever audit of Democratic Party spending. He has appeared on multiple national radio and television networks and is a regular contributor to The Nation and The New York Times. In his New York Times bestseller, Brown is the New White, How the Demographic Revolution Has Created a New American Majority, Phillips sparked a national discussion of race and electoral politics and the misdirected spending priorities of the Democratic Party. In the new, completely revised and updated paperback version, Phillips addresses the aftermath of the 2016 election, doubling down on his original insights, attacking the myth of the white swing voter head on. It's time for Talkish. Let's talk with Steve Phillips, the man named one of America's top 50 influencers by campaigns and elections. Steve, brown is the new white. What exactly does that mean, first of all? And and, and talk to me about the, the new American majority. Let's get started with that, and then we can go forward. So the title of the book, I mean, really, it's a, kind of a riff on... Um Orange, the Orange is the New Black, that theme from the uh, fashion world, um, which where a lot of that started. Um, but it has to do with the history, the history of politics in this country has focused on white voters as the starting point. Because um, for a long time, that's all the who could vote <laughs> within the country. Um, but that now we have a, a changed composition of the country. And people of color have grown from 12% of the population to 40% of the population and that the starting point for politics and putting together coalitions now has to be uh, people of color. And so that thing about Brown is the new central starting point um, in terms of uh, analyzing and organizing in politics. So let's start here. So Hillary lost, even as the majority of voters rejected Trump's hate-based campaign, and surely gerrymandering in the Electoral College affected that loss. Then there was Bernie and there was Jill Stein. My point. There's a lot to look at here, starting with the reality that the system doesn't seem to be working on a lot of levels, Steve, and, and specifically those I just noted. I mean, the Electoral College isn't going away. Gerrymandering is a problem. Republican-led states. Are the cards stacked against the Dems? Well, they're, I mean, they're, they're stacked against efforts for justice and equality, the reason that we you know, have these problems that we have in this country, but that they're, they're not insurmountable. And so... For all of the things that went wrong and all of the obstacles that um, uh, were thrown up in 2016, the Democrats still should have won. And had there been proper investment in uh, the communities of color in general, and African American community in particular, and inspiration of from those in, to those communities, uh, we would had a, we would have had a different outcome. If African Americans had voted at the same level that they voted in 2012. Hillary Clinton will be president, and the Democrats would, would uh, likely hold the U.S. Senate. So, yes, there's obstacles in the way, but there's always an obstacles in the way of those fighting for justice and equality. And what a main point I'm trying to make in terms of the analysis I'm providing in my book is that we have the numbers to be able to take power and govern in a more just and equitable fashion. I watched Barack Obama's uh, race in 2008 in absolute awe. I... I 
I thought that was such a brilliant campaign. And, and now I'm talking in your game, maybe if, numbers, because he knew where to go. He knew where to, to uh, who he would get the votes from. He knew what communities. They had it down to a science, right, as to where they were going to pull the black vote or this vote or whatever vote they needed uh, within a certain state. So it was brilliantly handled. Did Hillary just, did her team just screw up, did not understand um, how to get, because it's a game. It's a, it's, it's a math game. It's a mathematical game. Uh, I'm curious what your answer would be to that. Yeah, I mean, here's the math. They they understood a lot of the mechanics, um, but I don't think they understood like the spirit behind it. And so, like, I was trying to quantify. So I've made the point, you know, point, you know, frequently and frequently in in, in, in this book that like the, when the super PACs in 2016 rolled out their first 200 million dollars in plans and spending. They had zero dollars allocated for black voter mobilization. And so you have that kind of a reality. And I was trying to quantify, like, well, what was the amount spent during the Obama years? And I realized it was like one and a half billion dollars. Because everything that you did, every ad that you ran, every, every campaign effort that you did was to elect or reelect this black man as president. And so when Clinton came along, she had the chance to have to continue having a, a ticket that had an aspiring person of color on it. They looked hard um, at Cory Booker, they looked at Tom Perez, and decided to go with an all-white presidential ticket. So you lacked the inspiration factor that was present with Obama, and, at the, and, and that, at the margin, is what happened, and then because we lost by the margin of 78,000 votes in three states. So the, this, is, this is a question that I think is a fair question to ask, and that is, did they assume too much. You know, Clinton was, Mr. Clinton was the black president, first black president. Did they just assume too much or what? Maybe it was her personality that just well, doesn't jail. Yes. Or well, do you all the above? <laughs> right, right. So it's actually a very cautious personality. And so, um, you know, you could make an argument that um, it was enough change to uh, be trying to have the first woman president. Um, but it was so it, it, it was assuming too much in terms of what they would get in terms of the African American vote, and over assuming the significance of the white swing vote. And so they wanted to go with Tim Kaine, the way to appeal to white men, um, but without appreciating that up against you know alpha white male trying to restore uh, white patriarchy that. Um, Tim Kaine was not going to be able to withstand, turn that tide. I, well, you know, I have to say this to you anyway, Steve, because it, it, it's, it's so crazy. You would think, with all the knowledge base that we have and the computers and the uh, uh, logarithms, however you would say that word, and yeah, that, that this thing could get down to not just mathematical equation, but science. And yet, you know, you can't account for the, human, the, the voter. You don't know. Black women supported her uh, quite well, right? Yep, 94%. Right. So, I mean, you know, she had that vote. So, so let's move on because, you know, the past is, is, should be an education to us, if nothing else, right? So we want to do that. But, mm-hmm. but, but taking into account what happened to Hillary, where things were in 2016, your model is that the progressive political future is not with increased advertising to those middle-of-the-road white voters. I call it the white bread men. But with it cultivating America's growing diverse majority. Now, listen to me, in fairness, Republicans call that identity politics. <laughs> and I'm wondering why. Do they, are they because they're scared of the reality that over the past five years, the population of American people of color has tripled in growth? I mean, is it identity yeah. politics or is it reality or is it both? And, and what's wrong with that anyway? Right. Well, it's very, it, it's, they are... In a lot of ways, Republicans better understand what is happening and are both scared of it and determined to do something about it. Um, the immigration law that led to the, the trip, that it took down the white only signs at our borders, is the exact immigration law that Trump is going after now and trying to get rid of. So they know very well what is actually happening and are very focused on it, more so even than, than, than Democrats do. We're always amused when people talk about identity politics in a country 
where the very first immigration law that was passed said that to be a U.S. citizen, you had to be a free white person, a, quote, free white person. And that was the governing law of this country, upheld by the United States Supreme Court uh, in the 20th century, upheld by the Supreme Court, all the way up to 1952. So this notion around identity politics is fundamental to who America is, and it's fundamental to Trump's candidacy and presidency, because he's saying that this is a white country, and that he is going to do everything he can to restore that reality. So the notion of people who are trying to promote that this is actually a multiracial country are somehow people promoting identity politics is, you know, frankly kind of laughable. It's bizarre is what it is, and it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of denial. <laughs> denial is that river and that running through that uh, Republican Party. Trump won with this forgotten white man. Is that a mathematically viable uh, win for 2020? Have the, Democrat, uh, have the demographics changed already? Well, if the if, if 2016 replicates and black voters don't come out and if the progressive vote splinters again, then yes. But it's critical to realize that he did not win the popular vote. He lost by 3 million votes right. in the popular vote. And he did not get the majority of vote in the state state from the Electoral College. So in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Florida, Trump got less than 50% of the vote. So that's the imperative, is how do we reassemble the anti-Trump vote, the pro-progressive, pro-multiracial vote, which is, in fact, the majority. And that's really the central argument that I'm trying to hammer home to people with my book and, I'm, and, I'm, and talking about these different analyses, is that despite the, all that has happened, what this man in the White House represents and is doing is not backed by a majority of people. Well, then you get into the same old, same old, which is... There's a mess out there. I, I want to bring this up now. The Dems still seemed confused to me, Steve. They, 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 they feel, I mean, they, they're reeling. And, and there is a very strong resistance. They're exhausted. They're confused. The DNC isn't raising money. There isn't a bona fide leader. Some people think the party's moving too far to the left and it's uh, turning into a, a, a Democratic version of the Republicans move to the right. And you say what to me? Well, there was actually a very good piece in the Washington Post that was uh, highlighting a lot of the new leaders who are stepping up in this period in time, um, in the uh, particularly African American leaders in this post Obama era. And so, yes, there is a level of unclarity and inertia and timidity from the very top of the Democratic Party. But there is also emerging a whole grouping of very inspiring leaders who can galvanize the constituencies which represent the majority. So Stacey Abrams is running for governor of Georgia. She will be the first African-American woman to be a governor of any state in the history of this country. Ben Jelson, the NLACP, is running to, uh, for governor of Maryland. Um, Andrew Gillum, who was, you know, was sued by the NRA and, uh, and he was mayor of Tallahassee, Florida, um, is running to be governor um, of, of Florida. Kamala Harris is emerging as a significant leader and op leader of the resistance um, out of California. So you have, in fact, the emergence of a set of leaders who can move things forward. And so this is the direction and the struggle and the tension in 2018 is which direction and which leaders are going to emerge as the new face of the party who can help us take back this country. I think th there's something that I thought while you were saying all of that, and, and, and wouldn't it be wonderful to have the first uh, African-American governor, particularly in Georgia, uh, we can go all those routes. But all those people pretty much that you named are young, don't have huge, uh, Kamala Harris, I think, uh, has, a name for, has made a name for herself that's uh, national. But can these people rise quickly, get the money they need quickly, move forward quickly, because we're already <laughs> into 2000, into 2018, and pretty far in. Talk to me about that, because that, that, that and, and we're not raising money as Democrats. They're just not doing it, and I'm not sure why, but they're not. Right. So in, uh, prior to July of 2004, nobody had heard of Barack Obama. He was a state legislator. Uh, and who actually then you know, won his uh, Senate seat and then 
realized that that was happening in the country and that he could uh, uh, ride that wave uh, and, and, and through the White House. So similarly, this is what's happened. So that's the thing about, you know, what drove me to write the book. So many people thought that, you know, Obama was this once-in-a-lifetime figure, I want to replicate that again. But if you understand that Obama was the, uh, you know, he's a surfer, right, from Hawaii, that he rode a wave. And that demographic trend is continuing. And so that wave can continue to propel. And so looking at, you know, Kamala Harris, looking at Cory Booker, looking at other, you know, diverse candidates who come out of these communities, speak to and unleash the enthusiasm and energy that is there, we can very much uh, turn this thing around um, fairly quickly, particularly in the modern era where there's so much communication happens much more rapidly and social media, et cetera. So... Uh, I'm not that worried about that, frankly. It's really more more worried about we're going to do the, nut, the nitty-gritty nuts and bolts work to get voters out to vote in the midterm so we can take back Congress and finally put a check on this White House. Yeah, um, yeah Texas uh, was yesterday, and, and uh, it, it was a little bit disconcerting. I thought um, there were more Democrats who came out, but uh, twice as many Republicans who don't normally uh, go out got out. And yet, you know, look what happened in Alabama, uh, and black women saved the day. Uh, for the Democrats and for Morrell, right. by the way, <laughs> I yeah. think a pretty important yeah. point to be made uh, on that. But but and I want to talk about Cory Booker just because I'm a, a big fan of Cory Booker. I'm a New Jersey girl originally, and I I uh, followed his career from early on, and and he he bowls me over. You're friends with him. He do, he doesn't seem to be able to catapult himself um, over the hurdle. Why? Oh, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think that Corey actually is quite well positioned um, and is speaking up and speaking as a very, you know, passionate advocate and a strong voice around uh, immigration reform and protecting the dreamers. And, you know, I've got a lot of uh, attention and support for that. Uh, he wrote a very strong piece uh, supporting uh, unions and the, and, and the Supreme Court case that's going to be attacking uh, union financing. And I think for me, uh, Corey is as likely as anybody else in the country to be the next president of the United States. So if you were taking bets, who do you think the nominee is going to be? Uh, there's going to be about 45 candidates. Um, but, you know, it's not coincidental that the Democrats only won when they've had, in the past 20 years, they've had a person of color on the ticket. And so I think, you know, looking that argues for Corey and Kamala to be looked at very strongly as uh, potential uh, leaders. So those are the people who have my attention the most. Being of the Jewish and and white persuasion and a woman, <laughs> can we get a Jew in there? <laughs> I mean, I, right? You got to laugh. You got to laugh at yeah, this. No, I mean, uh, you got to laugh. I mean... I, you know, I'm saying that, but I'm and I'm joking, but I'm also saying that um, uh, uh, it's interesting that a white woman couldn't win, and uh, um, you know, that's that that is disconcerting as well. And uh, there's certainly a yeah, but we make we make a mistake in over interpreting what happened and not appreciating just how much of a um, you know historical perfect storm. Kind of came together for her to not win. And I think it's an overreaction to feel like, well, this country won't elect a woman because she got three million more votes than the, than the other person did. Right. So, and it, it was a lot of the um, sexism, I think, that diminished her vote just enough. But it would be a mistake to conclude that, well, there, that didn't work, whereas, in fact, we came within an inch. And then if we go back at it again, and the country will be even more diverse in 2020. You could absolutely elect a woman president. How are you feeling about the Latino voters? I know the, the Republicans, oh, they're, they're, they're pushing to try and get some blacks. So, you know, look what all those Democrats did for all you blacks. You know, Trump's old line. Uh, he's done so much for them, right? Uh, and, and, and Latinos. Uh, now, that's an interesting vote. And I live in Florida, by the way. I, I, could, I could give you a song and dance about some of the things you've said mm. because of what's going on down here. This is a very strange place. Uh, you know, the further north you go in Florida, the further south you've gone. You go. You know, you've heard that, I'm sure. 
uh, but but I've heard some stuff in homes here that I just bristle, just bristle. I mean, the amount of prejudice here is beyond belief, beyond belief. I'm saying that to you on air because I'm so astonished by some of the things that I hear in private parties from people. But but that being said, uh, that Latino voter, what, what, what about mobilizing Latino voters? Right. And so, yeah, I mean, the thing about Florida is that Florida actually is the state that had probably the largest surge of uh, supporters for Trump. So people who had had these more regressive views but had not had a champion came out in droves in Florida. Hillary did better in Florida than uh, Obama did. But there was, in fact, a surge for, for Trump there. But that's a perfect example of where that is all can all be mitigated by the Latino vote as the growing population, and particularly this year, or heading to you know, 2018, 2020 in Florida, with Puerto Ricans, right? So with the, with the whole crisis there and lots of people moving from Puerto Rico to Florida, to Central Florida, that's a population that can actually determine who the next uh, governor uh, is of Florida and who wins the presidential in, in, in 2020. So Latino vote... The biggest problem is making sure is is working to increase the participation levels, and so you know mentioned Texas is that you know lost Texas by eight hundred thousand votes. There are three million eligible non-voting Latinos in Texas, and so that's what I would, that's probably my biggest critique of the Democrats is like, well, where is the hundred million dollar initiative to hire deeply? people from the communities, have them work with their neighbors, create the infrastructure, ongoing communications to maximize that community's participation. That's where I think Democrats are falling down. Well, I'm going to give you something uh, that might find you might find interesting. I live in central Florida on the coast, very, you know, upper class uh, community, surrounded by Orlando and all of those Puerto Ricans who've moved in, etc. All of that is going on. You cannot say you are a Democrat in these counties, <laughs> you will be pilloried. I, I kid you not. It is that bad down here. Yeah, no, I'm sure it is. And I think that the conservatives are very vocal and empowered right now. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, but what, what we're failing to appreciate in all of these states, even the, even the you know, more significantly red ones, as you look at the, the uh, Senate races, and a lot of people in these places also voted against Trump. And so that's, in particular, a place like Florida, where he barely won that state. So, yes, I think the his supporters are more empowered and, you know, uh, virulent in their, their expressions, but they're not more numerous. A scary place to be, that I can tell you. Because you, you, you have to navigate it. It's that bad. So leave me with this. No. <laughs> leave me with, with your sorcery hat on, your saucer's hat on, and tell me what's going to happen in the midterms, and then give us a peek at what you think is really going to happen. You think Trump is out in 2020, based on all well, your mathematical so stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, there's so much chaos with this presidency and this you know, point in time. There's no guarantee, there's no guarantee that Trump is going to make it to 2020, um, and there's no guarantee that he will run for re-election. Uh, I, I continue to believe he did not want to be president. He wanted to be more famous, and he accomplished that. And it's like the dog who caught the car. I'm just saying it's like it's uh, uh, you know this is hard work, it's harder than I thought it was going to be. Right. So I'm not convinced he's not going to say, well, I, I did everything. I'm not running again. So who knows? You can't you can't plan any of that. The immediate challenge is taking back Congress because that's what I've said is as bad as it has been with the unleashing of the racism, the sexism, the xenophobia. What's even worse is the silence and complicity of Congress is to know better and to allow this to occur and what that means for the future of this country and our institutions and the notion of what you can get away with and not get away with. So it's imperative on so many levels that we take back Congress. And I am optimistic, not just not optimistic, I'm, if you look at the math, that uh, Democrats need 24 seats to take back Congress. Hillary won. Uh, the Republicans hold uh, 22 seats that Hillary won. And there's another five that she came very close in. And so the numbers are there if you have the turnout. And, there, and so what happens in midterm elections is that turnout drops, and whichever party has a lower, has a lower drop 
is the party that can usually prevail. That's what happened to the Democrats in 20, 2010. Right? Democratic turnout dropped 26 million votes. Republican turnout dropped just 7 million votes. So what we have seen in pretty much every election that's happened since Trump became president is a dramatic uh, enthusiasm gap. Democrats are voting at a much higher level than Republicans are. Now, if that continues, which it looks like it's going to, the Democrats will take back the House. Uh, it may likely actually even take back the Senate in that regard. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, but the trend has been, if you look at the turnout numbers for all these different special elections throughout the Texas primary, that there's a, there's a differential. A much higher percentage of Democrats are voting than Republicans. And if that continues, then we will be able to take back the House. And the country's going to be more diverse in 2020 than it was even in 2016. So I'm actually quite optimistic about taking back the White House, uh, the immediate imperative of making sure we do the work um, to get folks out to vote so we can take back Congress. And money, money, money. Hey, Steve, lovely to talk with you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I've been speaking with Steve Phillips. His must-read book is Brown is the New White, How the Demographic Revolution Has Created a New American Majority. For more information about Steve's work, visit stevephillips.com and democracyincolor.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to Talkish with Hallie Castor-Jane, The Hallie Castor-Jane Show a production of Resec LLC. Be sure to tune in to Talkish Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, when new podcasts are posted at HallieCasserJane.com and on all your favorite apps. We are open 24-7. So, until next time, when we meet again, this is Hallie Casser Jane.